I have a very expensive edition and uh, it was printed later than most of you people. And my translation has ruled out, blackened out, these words. Uh, It's for good reason, because according to the footnote in my text, uh, footnote, the word itself was added by a bald-headed, cross-eyed Egyptian living in the 16th century BC. 16th century BC. What? BC. Yeah. So 12th century before Plato's. Oh yeah, that's why I knew it was authentic. Of no insight is that also the footnote that you yeah. <clears throat> that's what it says. No insight. So just check. You think it's a bogus quote? No, I don't. I, I, it's a I footnote. Just wanted to know because yeah, merely yeah. bogus is cross-eyed. It's a well-known <laughs> point that if you make more than one Egyptian footnote, man. you have to call them feet notes. There. Well, look here. Uh, I know a way out of it. Uh, would you tell me what I would lose by knocking out these words? Because they're totally unnecessary according to the footnote. Well, better than that, would you tell me what that word means? Okay, I'll write it down so I don't want to. Nothing other than that. Nothing other, other than that.
redundant of the word itself. This is a sixth letter word. <coughs> and anything more than A is profound, but this is only a sixth of what is it? What is the name? Alone. Alone? mind telling me something. When this three-letter word is in front of A suggests what? Many. And when you use the one, therefore these are totally unnecessary. It's already contained in the article. Right? Yeah. So cross it out of your text. It's totally unnecessary. It doesn't add a damn thing. Well, my to somebody who can't grasp the idea of Well, how about if you just put the good? Is that the same thing? As the good itself? Seems so. Would you not agree we need a one? Yeah. <laughs> Would you not agree he came at the right time? Absolutely. Just in the nick of time. Well, <laughs> what is the choice? What is that word? Self. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got it. Yeah. You came to the right place. And in my text, these are ruled out with a footnote that they are not necessary. And therefore, I was interested in knowing about the word. So, what does that mean? Well, it picks out something that stands alone and other things. Oh, stands alone. Okay. All right, kind of thing. <coughs> okay. Not on feet, though. Stands alone. But what does the that do? It does not do the same thing. That do it, stand alone. Therefore, it's redundant. It's the same thing said over to make it look more complex and difficult. And therefore, we can rule it out as unnecessary. Is that good? <laughs> It does something, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what, like, um, the good it has to do Look here, itself. look here, look here. If someone adds a, it's foolish to add something you don't need. Uh, right, Martin? Yeah. See? Therefore, it's true. What do they need? Agree? It? We can knock it out. It's not totally unnecessary. Or you. He doesn't use it for the just and ties. Right? It's just, it's putting, you know, it's putting horns on the snake. Right? No matter how much you try, it's not going to work. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who tried for three weeks and it didn't work. Well, I think it's what's called an intensive program, isn't it? For what? Among, along with reflexive. Can't it be an intensive? I was thinking reflexive. Mm -hmm. It's like stamping your feet. Well, I right? think it's like a wake up down Intensive the pronoun, right? You know, don't settle for... Hey, stupid! Not very much. You wake up. I, I do, right, okay. I think, it, I think it's something like, don't settle for what you think of as beauty, but rather go to beauty itself, experience beauty itself. And meaning, go past what is what a common meaning of it, and go for um, the truth of it, that which is, which is what they describe it as later. <coughs> Anything that you stamp as that which is. Okay. So, 
Okay, I just wanted to wait some time. What do you think of the fact that he doesn't use it for the just and the pikes? Less. Yeah, the more stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, at seventy, seventy-five, at seventy-nine. <clears throat> how about seventy-nine? Otherwise, you're gonna have. Seventy nine. I'm after one word, okay? I want to know how frequently this word is being used. Seventy nine A? Seventy nine A. That would be um, blabbity blab. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let us turn to what we have discussed already. Right? Got it? Now, there's one word I'd like you to go through this page, down at the bottom, all through the next page. And just count how many times a curious word is being used, and you have to tell me how important it is. Right? Now I know this is going to, this is a counting game. So that's seventy-eight. Here's the word now. How is that word being used? This expression always in the same state. It's always contrasted with things that are in change. Agree? Yes or no? Yes. And as you go down the next page, how often do you see that term being stressed? Always in the same order, in the same way, right? contrasted with change. Is that true or not? Same word as Soul is divine. I'm interested in uh, the terms that are using to describe both of these terms. Before we do some work tonight, this is just background, so it's probably. So if you were going to pull these pages together, how often do you see this idea of the same and remains the same, etc.? Is, is it an important thing? Does he make distinctions between the same and changing again and again throughout this whole argument?
kind of conclusion he makes, I enjoy I, when he uses this expression. Most like, right? the soul is most like, the divine is most like. So, as you look over those pages, uh, would you agree the idea of same is frequently used? Key? Oh. By the way, does he get qualities then for things, ideas that he connects with what's divine? And could we not now get ideas that are connected with the soul? Could we then compare these different sets of ideas? And how important is the word saying? Because by contrast, would you agree, he then goes to what is other than soul or body. And there are a bunch of, would you not agree, ideas connected with that. And what we have then is a comparison, don't we? Is that the way you reason it out? Well, I'd be more yeah. comfortable reasoning it out if I actually saw it explicitly on both sides. I mean, you're asking me to just kind of conclude from likelihood because unfortunately I don't have the list of descriptive ideas about the soul or the divine handy to my psyche. So I can conclude and would love to conclude, but actually I couldn't have a sounder conclusion if I made that grouping. Hmm. Good. <laughs> you know, so could we look at those descriptions and see the likeness and the use of the term same with respect to the soul and with respect to the divine? Well, uh, and how important is most like? I don't know, because I have to tell you, I worked on some parts of the Phaedo and not others. This is one is not sticking in my brain very well. But I will accept, I will accept a list of these terms from anyone here who has them, even yourself. Not me. I'm known yeah. as Pierre the Slow and Dull. So, <laughs> yeah, let's get help from Ekmar. Oh, good. I mean, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Agree? Yeah. Yeah. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Men, horses, cloaks, any other such things, which get called by these other names. Oh, did, were we asking for a list? Of the soul and the divine, as opposed to the body. Right, so. Or at least that's what I On the side of body would be men, horses, and cloaks. The things that yeah, have the same name. The soul of the divine. The soul of the divine. Okay. Yeah, the beautiful itself, the good soul. Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions. Okay? You ask. What does this little exercise do to you? Right, we started with this curious word. Now we're using another one. Always remains the same, and then, right, we're doing this and looking for the idea of same and other, or difference, are we not? Same and changing, contrast. Ask you how important is this expression? Just wondered. Boring. No, it's very important. Why? Mm -hmm. In terms of the argument, which is, from my understanding, Then are you willing to do what I suggested, wherever you see this word, blank it out? No, it has to be. What, why? Let me do that again. Why? No. Second one is better. Go ahead. Because that's what But what does it add? Did you agree everything that some volunteers put here is already contained in the idea of that? No. It means that it means that it doesn't 
Change. Like what? It doesn't change. <coughs> so doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Notice how clever I was. She raised two points, and of course I ignored the first. Yeah. Right, and put only the second. I hope you didn't notice that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, she. Why'd you do that? Because I got it on. Uh, capricious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, so what, is there, are you familiar with Greek? Yeah. Is that because you go to Greek restaurants? Uh, I know. I know my restaurant uh, adventures is totally aside. Oh, you're studying? Yes, sir. Oh, so what's this word? Uh, well, it's still together. He's got one of those yeah. Greek things, so we can get it from him. Alto. Uh, don't let you put it up so it's most beautiful. And since he knows this stuff, we can ask him a question or two. Yeah. Welcome. Oh, good. So this is the beautiful itself. Oh, the beautiful. But this is the itself. Oh. Uh, what? <laughs> can you tell me what this word means? Huh? Itself. No, no, no. Just a word. You're going to put it. Well, okay. Get as much <laughs> as you can. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking. It's all Does anyone else know Greek? Uh, sorry? What is that word? Yeah. Word. yeah. It's one of those things. <laughs> okay. Tonight we're going to have a war against this word. <laughs> so literally in the Greek, what does that word mean? Same. Same. What? Hey. It means same. Hey. <laughs> there it is. Oh, wait a minute. The beautiful sun. Now that's curious, see, because in English itself, it has no balls. Right? Neuter. Right? And self, we have all kinds of images for that, don't we? And itself, you're saying something that is neuter, right? A self that's neuter. But that's not the word. That's not in it, is it? What's in it is this. Now, what's going on? So, look here, could it be, uh, now would you not agree, this is often assumed in Greek. You don't have to spell it out. Agree. So, is, the, is this idea that uh, it is the same, remains the same. Is that what the word itself really means? If so, then you're talking about the beautiful, hey, it remains the same, so it remains the same, it always remains the same, the good. It always remains the same. Oh. And then he explores this idea and this whole argument, doesn't he? Right? Do you find that curious or useful? Or? Why? What is it? Any folks, uh, what it, what it's 
directly towards the meaning. Pardon? More. It evokes what it's talking about. It evokes what it's talking about. But when you use this word, then you join these kinds of things. You learn nothing other than that. Right. You find that curious or useful or not? Uh, yeah. Why? Well, because of the in the present day, we associate all of those words. Those, we don't, we don't say itself is okay. in itself. It's Do you remember you said two things? Yeah, there's a change. That's right. right. You caught the idea, didn't you? Right. Right? That's the part I didn't put down. Right. So you're caught, right? What does that do? Can you then beware of this usage? Mm -hmm. And keep in mind what? See. Always the same. The name's the same. Say that. Okay. I've trained this. Christians have trained you. Well, now uh, this is bringing up to me, so we use, they, they use the word essence or being, and that often I hear is the word is good. Yeah, they're going to say that is the same. No, so I'm uh, not sure. Or I, right, then uh, here's my problem with it. If, if it's that which reverses upon itself, That's right. how is that to be That's right. the same? Yeah, right, right. That's a, a terribly uh, rich question, so. Uh, <coughs> This idea of turning on itself, only intelligent, anything that has any degree of intelligence has this. To know that you're in pain means you're suddenly aware of And to, to then consider yourself on many levels, you're reflecting, right? You're standing back and returning about and considering yourself. <coughs> We're talking about the experience of the beauty itself. It is the same. But what's curious about it is that it admits of greater and greater degrees of interpenetration. It remains the same, but it has, if you have the um, opportunity, um, therefore one can make distinctions in it though there are no parts of it. This means, therefore, <clears throat> uh, you can penetrate it it's, uh, depending upon how strong you are. Now, this experience, like luminosity, uh, that can be a flash, or some people can stay in it a certain length of time to the degree that they're staying in it. They're not, they're in the sand, but they can penetrate it more profoundly. So it's not that the thing changes, it's the... It person, remains the same, but... The person's ability to stay there and, and endure or embrace it as fully as possible is what changes. Yes, you're saying we can take that difference and say that's the degree to which this person opens up to it. Right. So in that respect, you're putting the variation in terms of the perceiver or the person experiences this rather than the state itself. But right. right. that's what you use. Rokos put that nicely. I forget what proposition, but he says the 
It's never the divine light's failure, it's the unfitness of the participant. Yeah. 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 Prohibition. Yeah. Yeah. Retreats from all the, alien. All everything. Yeah, all that is alien to it. Yeah. It's a beautiful proposition. Yeah. 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 Right? So remains the sun. So the idea of sand and who see it and what you get from it, right? Uh, what you get from it. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, but, but you're open to is a more profound experience of nature of open reality. So therefore a person can say, wow! I've seen a lot of things that were real in my day, but there ain't nothing I've ever encountered more real than that. Oh, reality. Oh, hey, I've seen beautiful things, but I have nothing like this. This is pure beauty. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Hey, you know when you, <laughs> you know what I mean, but well, that really is. Oh, really? You mean truly is? Yeah. Oh then you discover it truly is. That's true. Let's discover the nature of truth. These are not separate individual different perceptions. There are names you can put on the nature of the experience that you that's here. So a whole set of terms, a whole set of terms, therefore, we can then Do the same thing we did before. So these terms then become those ideas that, and of course, anyone encountering comes up with the same language, therefore, this philosophical language of these experiences is universally found in all traditions. But some traditions are going to be more precise in their use of language, loving words, and the mind, than others. Now, then you can put these. Uh, together in a whole bunch of sentences. Go ahead and make one more. Uh, <laughs> Janet, make one. Mm. That's good. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> now put it in words, hear that? I can't write that on the board. <laughs> Go on. Oh. Mm. The most beautiful, the purest being. Now, revealing the truth. Yeah, of so you, you want the truth. Yeah, okay. Now, next to all of these are expressions that you can put in the negative. Okay? All right. Uh, next to each one of these, there can be a whole set of negatives. And therefore, we read that description of the experience of beauty of self, the perfection of beauty of self in the symposium. There are a bunch of negatives, aren't there? Starts out with a positive, everlasting, does he not? And he calls that a knowledge, doesn't he? Right? Encountering that, that's knowing. There's nothing else that's knowing. That's knowing. Got the quote? Yeah, please. Whoever shall be guided so far towards the mysteries of love by contemplating beautiful things rightly in due order is approaching the last period. Suddenly he will behold a beauty marvelous in its nature. Right, so it's marvelous, that's positive. Go ahead. That very beauty, Socrates, for the sake of which all the earlier hardships have been born. Therefore, this is the uh, experience that brings about the meaning of life. Go ahead. Where he says it twice in two different ways. Go ahead. In the first place, okay. everlasting, and never being born negative. Right? This is whatever you encounter, you know what? That stuff ain't ever been born, and it ain't gonna die. Right. Neither increasing nor diminishing. Hey. No increase or diminishing. Right? Same. 
Go ahead. Watch the many ways he uses the words. You can put the word same in here. Go ahead. Secondly, not beautiful here and ugly there. Same. Not beautiful now and ugly there. Same throughout time. Not beautiful in one direction and ugly in another direction. Same in all spatial regards, right? Nothing that is not. Go ahead. Not beautiful in one place and ugly in another place. It permeates all that is in an overwhelming view. Uh, again, this beauty will not show itself to him like a face. Negative. So not, it's not going to show itself as a face or a hand or any physical thing whatsoever. Or hands or any bodily thing at all. Or you're spelling in the negatives. All those. Um, later, we've got a couple of more positives. So yeah, I'll keep going. Nor is a discourse or a science. It ain't a discourse and it's not a science because this is a pure experience. Would you agree all of these negatives can be translated into this one word or behind it all? Different ways of talking about the same. Isn't it? So you can collect all the negatives, put in the positives. That's what it is to carry about an understanding of that experience, at least in part, because you also need the stages and what follows after that. But go ahead. Um, nor indeed is residing in anything in a living creature, or in earth, or heaven, or anything else. But being by itself, with itself, holy, it its remains, same. see the idea, it remains the same. It's not in anything, it's not innate in anything, it's not inherent in anything. Right. No. But being by itself, with itself, always in simplicity. Right. Ah, not a positive, see, simplicity. Right? Right? Line them up, simplicity. While all the beautiful things elsewhere partake of this beauty in such manner that when they are born and perish, it becomes neither less nor more, and nothing at all happens to it. No matter how many things participate in this, it remains the same. Same. See the key idea. Same. 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 Therefore, when we use the word itself, we lose that dimension. God. So that when anyone by right new loving goes up from these beautiful things to that beauty and begins to catch sight of it, he will almost touch the perfect secret. What's the perfect secret? The same. That's right. <clears throat> but let me tell you the right way to approach the things of love or to be led there by another is this. Beginning from these beautiful things to mount for that beauty's sake ever upwards as by five steps one to two and two all beautiful bodies. And for beautiful bodies to beautiful pursuits and practices, and for practices to beautiful learnings. So that from learnings he may come at last to that perfect learning which is the learning solely of that beauty itself. And may know at last that which is the perfection of beauty. Not the truth of it, the perfection of beauty. See? Perfection. Highest level of perfect. Perfect. Perfection of beauty. Uh, there in life and there alone, my dear Socrates, that he inspired one of his life with living to man while he contemplates view itself. If ever you see this, it will seem to you to be far above gold and raiment, beautiful boys and men, the beauty you are now entranced to see, and you and many others are ready so long as they see their darlings and remain never with them. It would be possible not to eat or drink, but only to gaze at them and to be with them. What indeed! Should we think if it were given to one of us to see beauty undefiled, pure, unmixed, not adulterated with human flesh, sure. not adulterated with human flesh and colors and much other mortal rubbish, and if he could behold beauty in perfect simplicity, right? Go back to simplicity, perfect simplicity. Do you think that a new life for a man to be looking to her, contemplating that, and abiding with it? Do you not reflect? Do you not reflect that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind which alone can see it to give birth not to likenesses of virtue since he touches no likeness but to reality since he touches reality. 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 Right. Therefore, this is right. You're able right to connect all of these terms. Right. So, 
All the negatives are different ways of talking about the idea of the same, isn't it? Therefore, this word itself, it cheats, doesn't it? It loses that dimension. And especially in this argument, since the idea of same goes through the entire section that we are now going to get into a little bit once more. Okay? I thought we'd do this before we started. <laughs> I need a cup of coffee for a moment. Central. <clears throat> Most like. 
What is that name? Most likely. <laughs> Certain kind of comparison, isn't that? Is he insisting upon an identity? Is? No. Most like. <clears throat> Probable. Right, it's most like. Does that lead to certainty? When someone says, well, the soul is most like the divine? Barbara? Sure. I don't know how to answer that. Does it lead to certainty? Well, if we take is most like and just substitute a better word, So, is the divine? Like, this is an argument that rests upon that one phrase, most likely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not an identity, most likely. But if you say is, aren't you saying it is an identity? If you say the soul is? And most like, is that an identity? No. No. No, it's no. Does that lead to certainty, most like? Oh, I see what you're asking. It would seem not. <coughs> not to certainty. No. It's closest to certainty. <laughs> hey. <Sorry. clears throat> I'll change it. Most like is another word for what is. Likely or likelihoods. Agree? Therefore, let me go back to an earlier part of the text. The way he starts the discussion with C.D. continues. Exactly at the second gate. We went to second gate to the city. The issue, you see, is there's a, there's a notion that philosophy in Plato tries to frame arguments that lead to certainties, not likelihoods. So at 70 BC, the whole discussion is opened up by Socrates. <clears throat> After Sebius talks about, hey, you know what? Uh, upon death, many people think the soul is <coughs> subject to the same thing that happens when anything is like smoke reaches the air and scatters, and there's nothing left of it. Smoke that would scatter in the same thing. The soul, when it dies, it too is scattered. What you say, Sebius, is true, said Socrates, but not. Now, what should you do? Do you wish to keep on conversing about this to see whether it is? Probable or not? 
These arguments are all based upon probabilities, likelihoods, not after certainty. Therefore, when we're going back into this, you see, let us see whether or not he maintains that and where he deviates from it. So going back now to uh, 79 AD. <clears throat> Remember the searching for the word saying? And as you do so, when you check every time you see more similar, more similar. More like, more this, right? More like, more unlike, more similar. Is that the language that's being used? Seventy-nine to eighty. Perhaps we should get a couple of people to read it, and then we can share it. Put them in the Mention, sure. And you give me a couple of them. Into it, okay. All right. Sorry, uh, how about we start at uh, seventy-eight? B. Well then, said Socrates. Must we not ask ourselves such questions as this? What kind of thing naturally suffers dispersion? And what kind of thing might we naturally fear? And again, what kind of thing is not like it to? After this, we must, um, must we not inquire to which class the soul belongs? base our hopes and fears for our souls upon the answer to these questions. You are quite right. Thank God, my, in what class are you going to put it in? Got to get this class, we're going to get that class. Right, and then we're going to have the soul and see which one of those two classes it fits in. Okay, we go. Okay. Yep. Now is not. Jump in. Now is not that which is compounded a composite naturally liable to be decomposed in the same way in which it was compounded. And if anything is uncompounded, is not that, if anything, naturally unlikely to be decomposed. I think that is true. Then it is most probable that things which are always the same and unchanging are the uncompounded things. And the things that are changing and never the same are the composite. Yeah, see, it's most probable. <clears throat> see the language? Go ahead. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let us then turn to what we were discussing before. Is the absolute essence which we in our dialectic process of question and answer call true being always the same or is it liable to change? Absolute equality, absolute beauty any absolute existence, true being, do they ever admit of any change whatsoever? Or does each absolute essence, since it is uniform, it exists by itself, remain the same, and never in any way admit of any change? It must necessarily remain the same. But how about the many things, for example, men, or horses, or cloaks, or any other such thing? which bear the same names as the absolute essences and are called beautiful or equal and the like. Are they, always, are they always the same? Or are they in direct opposition to the essences, constantly changing in themselves, unlike each other, and so to speak, never the same? The latter, they are never the same. And you can see these and touch them and perceive them by the other senses. Whereas the things which are always the same can be grasped only by the reason right. and are invisible and not to be seen. Right, only by the understanding. Go ahead. Certainly, that is true. Now, shall we assume two kinds of existences, one visible, the other invisible? Let us assume that, and that the invisible is always the same and the visible constantly changing. Well then, are we not made up of two parts, body and soul? Yet, 
Now, to which class should we say the body is more similar and more closely akin? To the visible. That is clear to everyone. And the soul, is it visible or invisible? Right. More similar and more closely akin, right? The same, go ahead. Uh, invisible to man, but we call things visible and invisible with reference to human vision, do we not? Yeah. Then what do we say about the soul? Can it be seen or not? It cannot be seen. Then it is invisible. Yeah. Then the soul is more like the invisible than the body is, and the body more like the visible. Necessarily. Now we have also been saying for a long time, have we not, that when the soul makes use of the body for any inquiry, either through seeing or hearing or any of the other senses, for inquiry through the body means inquiry through the senses, then it is dragged by the body to things which never remain the same. And it wanders about, it's confused and dizzy like a drunken man, because it lays hold upon such things. Certainly. But when the soul inquires alone by itself, it departs into the realm of the pure, the everlasting, the immortal, and the changeless. And being akin to these, it dwells always with them whenever it is by itself. It is not hindered, and it has rest from its wanderings, and remains always the same and unchanging with the changeless, since it is inconvenient therewith. And this state of soul is called the basis, is it not so? Perfectly, what you say is perfectly right there too. And now again, in view of what we said before, and what has just been said, to which class do you think the soul has greater likeness and kinship? I think, Prakriti, that anyone, even the dog, would agree, after this argument, <coughs> that the soul is infinitely more like that which is always the same than that which is not. And the body is more like the other. Consider the, the matter in another way. When the soul and the body are joined together, nature directs the one to, be, to serve Nature directs the one to serve and be ruled, and the other to rule and be master. Now this being the case, which seems to you like the divine, and which like the mortal? Or do you not think that the divine is by nature fitted to rule, and lead, and the mortal to obey and serve? Yes, I think. Which then does the soul resemble? Certainly, Dr. King, the soul is like the divine, and the divine like the mortal. Then C sees that this is not the conclusion of all that we have said, that the soul is most like the divine and immortal and intellectual and uniform and indissoluble and ever unchanging. And the body, on the contrary, most like the human and mortal and multiform and unintellectual and dissoluble and ever changing. Can we say anything like this seems to show that this is not so? No, we cannot. Well then, since this is the case, is it not natural for the body to meet with speedy dissolution, and for the soul, on the contrary, to be entirely indissoluble, or nearly so? Observe that when a man dies, the visible part of him, the body which lies in the visible world, which we call a corpse, which is naturally subject to dissolution and decomposition, does not undergo these processes at once, but remains for a considerable time, and even for a very long time, if death takes place when the body is in good condition, and at a favorable time of the year. But when the body is shrunk and involved, as is done in Egypt, it remains almost entire for an incalculable time. And even if the body decays, some parts of it, such as the bones and sinews and all that, are so to speak, indestructible. It's not that true? But the soul, the invisible, which departs into another place which is like itself, noble and pure and invisible, to the realm of the God of the world and truth, to the realm of the God of the other world and truth, to the good and wise God, whither, if God will, my soul will soon go. Is this soul, which has such qualities and such a nature, straightway scattered and destroyed when it departs from the body, as most men say? 
far from it, dear cities and cities, that the truth is much rather this, that it departs pure, dragging with it nothing of the body, because it never will be associated with the body of life, but avoided it and gathered itself into itself alone, since this has always been its constant study. But this means nothing else than that it pursued philosophy rightly and really practiced being in a state of death, or is not this the practice of death? By all means. Then if it is in such a condition, it goes away into that which is like itself, into the invisible, divine, immortal, and wise. And when it arrives there, it is happy, free from error and folly and fear and fierce loves and all the other human ills. And as the initiated say, lives in truth with all, after time, with the gods. Is this our new series or not? Sure. But I think if when it departs from the body, it is defiled and impure because it was always with the body and cared for it and loved it and was fascinated by it and its desires and pleasures so that it thought nothing was true except the corporeal, which one can touch and see and drink and eat and employ in the pleasures of love. And if it is accustomed to hate and fear and avoid that which is shadowy and invisible to the eyes, but is intelligible and tangible to philosophy, do you think a soul of this condition would depart pure and uncontaminated? No, I do But it would be interpenetrated, I suppose, with the corporeal, which intercourse and communion with it. the body had made part of its nature, because the body had been its constant companion and object of its care. Certainly. And my friend, we must believe that the corporeal is burdensome and heavy and earthly and visible. And such a soul is weighed down by this and is dragged back into the visible world through the fear of the invisible and of the other world. And so, as they say, it flits about the monuments and the tombs where shadowy shapes of souls have been seen, figures of those souls which were not set free of purity but retain something of the visible, and this is why they are seen. That is likely. It is likely, CDs. And it is likely that those are not the souls of the good, but those of the base, which are compelled to flip about such places as a punishment for their formal, former evil mode of life. And they flit about until, through the desire of the corporeal which clings to them, they are again imprisoned in the body. And they are likely to be imprisoned in natures which correspond to the practices of their former life. Uh, what natures do you mean? I mean, for example, that those who have indulged in gluttony and violence and drunkenness and have taken no pains to avoid them are likely to pass into the bodies of acid and other beasts of that sort. Do you not think so? Certainly, that is very likely. And those who have chosen injustice and tyranny and robbery to pass into the bodies of wolves and hawks and kites, where else can we imagine that they go? Beyond the doubt, they have to be cut to freedom. Then, is it clear where all the others go, each in accordance with its own habits? Yes. Well, then the happiest of those, and those who go to the best place, are those who have practiced by nature and habit, without philosophy or reason, the social and civil virtues, which are called moderation and justice. How are we to happy? Well, don't you see? Is it not likely that they pass again into some such social and gentle species as that of bees or of wasps or ants? Or into the human race again, and that worthy men spring from them? Yet, yeah. and no one who has not been a philosopher, who is not only pure like the parts, is allowed to enter into the communion of the gods, but only the love of knowledge. Right. So, what do you think? <clears throat> Going back to the thing. How important are those ideas? Most likely, likely, similar. The whole argument is based then on likelihoods. But in which class does it more likely to fall into? <clears throat> does that lead to certainty? No. No, no not no. as likely. No. But, but why? Why does he, why, why does he argue this? Well, why always comes after X. 
Why? <clears throat> why what? Why does he use this type of argument? No, the question is not why does he do it. Why do we demand that Plato is doing something he's not doing? Because we want to be certain. We, hey, we're in, <laughs> we are inflected with certainty. We're infected. Every major European philosopher, that's what they want to go after, certainty, certainty, certainty. See, they gave up faith and they needed something to replace it. And so they went from faith to certainty. But, but is, that, is this argument based upon certainty or probable, likely, likelihoods, most similar, akin to, but it's based therefore on parallels, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Parallels, creating parallels, isn't it? Like we're doing here, yeah. parallels analogies. We think Plato is, <coughs> we, can, we can detect all the logical errors in Plato and Socrates, Plato's thinking. We subject it to logical analysis. This is not logical analysis behind this. This is analogical structures. Analogies lead to likelihoods. Logic leads to certainties, unless you read modern philosophy. You know, like Papa Kugel, what did he do to it? He kicked it in the teeth, didn't he? Certainty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there went certainty. But all of these arguments are based upon like parallels, creating parallels, finding things that are akin to each, making conclusions, therefore it's analogical structure, and therefore it's likelihood. But we're supposed to get reality and truth out of this. No, no, no. You don't get re no, you don't get reality and truth from this. This is reasoning. This is un what he calls dianoia. This is understanding. Understanding. This is where you get reality and truth, not from analogical structures. So what? You want that stuff? Then well, this. What's the connection between these two? What is the connection between these two? Between likely, a likely, and a likelihood of real analogical reason. This does not. It's not analogical. Thing. This is experiential. And building up categories by making distinctions and finding a way to link these distinctions together into a unity. It's not one Making distinctions in something extremely vital and important. This is saying, look here, you want to use your understanding? Don't go for certainty. <laughs> want certainty? <laughs> Get in here. Wiggle your toes in this. <laughs> right? Uh oh. I like it. You like it. Yeah. Nice That's, distinction. Yeah. Very nice. And remember, <clears throat> in Plato's cosmology, the whole thing is analogy. Likely, it's all based upon likely or likely. Right. Likely. Right. Right. So now we should be ready to do some work when we get back. Right? Since we've covered a few things tonight. Okay. Get back from what? Get back from where? Well, because I'm going to just get back to my chair. Oh, okay. And then we're going to do some work, aren't we? Sounds good. Okay. What do we want to know? Hey, look. <clears throat> I like that great line, and uh, just have some fun with it. Seabees' this great statement. Uh, Conclusion.
where Seabuse makes that great remark about uh, it's infinitely, <laughs> it's infinitely similar. <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Right, you got that one? Yeah, it's uh, 79E, 270, page 279. What, 79E? E. E, okay, yeah. Your page <coughs> Go ahead. I think Socrates, go ahead. I think Socrates, anyone, even the dullest, would agree after this argument that the soul is infinitely more like that which is always the same as that which is common. Right. Hey, if something is infinitely more alike, <laughs> it's infinitely more alike, he nearly said what? Probably. Identical, probably. right? Probably. Uh, it's infinitely more similar, more alike. He seems pretty now look at Socrates' response, <laughs> two lines down. Uh, consider then the matter in another way. When the soul and the body are joined together, Nature directs the one to serve and be ruled, and the other to rule and be master. Now this being the case, which, which seems to you like the divine, and which like the mortal? Is that nice? Next line, next paragraph. <clears throat> Then see, Cibes, if this is not the conclusion from all that we have said, that the soul is most like the divine and immortal and intellectual and uniform and indissoluble and ever unchanging. Right? Then he makes the contrast. So therefore, I'm interested and seeing we can go to the conclusion of this discussion and see how it's, it's treated. Uh, Now he's got a lovely summary at 83. <clears throat> I will tell you, the lovers of knowledge perceive that when philosophy first takes possession of their soul, it is entirely fastened and welded to the body and is compelled to regard realities through the body as the prison bars, but not with its own unhindered vision, right? and is wallowing in utter ignorance. And philosophy sees that the most dreadful thing about the imprisonment is the fact that it is caused by the lusts of the flesh, so that the prisoner is the chief assistant in his own imprisonment. Now the part that's uh, um, the greatest evil is where I want to go, which is really the heart of all the work we've ever done in philosophical midwifery and everywhere else. So let me just get to the last long sentence in that paragraph at 83b. <clears throat> Now the soul of the true philosopher believes that he must not resist this deliverance, and therefore it stands aloof from pleasures and lusts and griefs and fears, so far as it can, considering that when anyone has violent pleasures or fears and griefs and lusts, he suffers from them, not merely what might, one might think, for example, illness or loss of money spent for his lusts, but he suffers the greatest and most extreme evil does not take it into account. 
What's that, Socrates? Here it is. Son. The evil is that the soul of them. <clears throat> the evil is that the soul of every man, when it is greatly pleased or pained by anything, is compelled to believe that the object which caused the emotion is very distinct, and very true, but it's not. These objects are mostly the visible ones, are they not? What is funny? What's the evil? The evil is not in something you're doing, it's the judgment and the belief you make from certain things. What? Here it is. What's the evil? Right? Curious kind of evil. It's a belief. Right? The soul of every man, when it's greatly pleased or attained by anything, is compelled to believe that the object which caused the emotion is very distinct and very true. And if you do, if you make that connection, then you're hooked on the thing and then habits are always made in respect to that belief you made as a consequence of what? The belief. Right. And that's, of course, consistent with what he talks about as courage in the Republic in Book 4. <coughs> book 2 and 4. Okay, conclusion. When Socrates had said this, there was silence for a long time. And Socrates himself was apparently absorbed in what had been said, as were most of us. But CB, Simeus and Cebes, they conversed a little with each other. And now they come up with two arguments, and that two arguments are going to go from this point until several pages. And it's beautifully done. Um, and it reaches its high point in sim simplest form at 87, where both Cebes and Simeus present the two great arguments. is to, as the strings of the lyre are like, the weaver is to, and 
the cloaks that the weaver weaves and wears are to, these are analogies. Look here. <clears throat> um, go back to the point you were making a moment ago. his view on this case about the nature of death. Okay. What's he going to do? He's going to pull it out. He's going to pull it out. He's going to look at it. He's going to say, oh, I see what you're saying. And then he states it. You know what? Every argument, every argument is an analogy. Every philosophical position is an analogy. One of the great books, and very few people get into it, but is Weinerger's philosophy of as if. <clears throat> what he did, what Weinerger did, is he took all the systems and he said, I'll show you what's behind every system. Analogy. Only for him, following Bentham and other people like him, he said, if it is an analogy, it is merely an analogy. <laughs> so he took, see, philosophy is a structure, he could have said, Philosophical arguments can be set, can be considered as analogical structures. No, no, he said they're only as ifs. Stressing, therefore, they can be rejected so easily because there's no certainty behind it. But in any case, he did this. So what is Socrates doing? He's listening to the guy who disagrees with him. He picks up their language and he says, oh, I see what you're saying. And then he's then is going to give it back to the person in terms of the analogy. And then what he's going to do? He's going to just take a look at the analogy and point out the fact that what he thinks is analogical is not. That's all. He's going to show it doesn't fit. And that's the end of it. But, he doesn't get him to believe what Socrates believes. He's going to say, hey, look, I can understand your position analogically. Let me show you that your analogical thinking happens to be very weak. It's not really analogical. Oh. <laughs> Therefore, he can still believe he's right, but he can't use that argument. He's caught. He's caught. Right, he can still disbelieve the argument of Socrates, but he'll need a new analogy. A new analogy. And Socrates will look at the analogy and point out, hey, you know, it either fits or it doesn't. It fits, and you agree with me. If you don't, it's it, 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 call it instead of illogical, illanalogical. <laughs> so look, this is where we're going. What's he doing? It's going to pull from the other party all of the details for each one. 
That's going to be simple, just like we're doing. All right? The lyre, the strings, the weaver, the cloak. What you're going to do? It's going to say, look here. Tell me all the ideas that are connected with each. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's all we need to do. And then we can see whatever you're going to say it's like. I'm, or we can also put in here uh, the other form of the wire, harmony. Same thing. Right. Um, it's going to draw out the, the terms. It's going to draw them out. It's going to show him that it is an analogy and that it doesn't fit because whatever is here, whatever is here, is equally going to have a set of terms. And the way they are watching, the way they're going to function together, the way in which they are going to function together won't follow for the original terms of the analogy. Uh -huh. The way they function won't fit. And then you can sit back and say, well, yes, it does seem likely to you because of these terms do seem to be similar to these terms. Yeah, 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 yeah. But not the way in which they function together. Enjoy it. So that's where we're going next to it. Okay? Be quick. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.